Welcome back to chapter four. This is our third lecture video for chapter four, and it's our last video that is going to be introducing brand new concepts. And we will soon be moving on to many different example problems that apply those concepts to real situations. All right, so we have one of Newton's laws left to, to discuss. It is in fact the least important of the three for our current curriculum. We will be seeing this in action and very important way off in chapter eight, but let's introduce it and talk about why it is helpful for us in a couple of ways now. So if we think about the two pictures shown on the slide, whether we are holding a giant bag of dog food in our hands and applying a force up that is fighting against the weight of the um, dog food, or if we set it down on the table to allow the table to basically hold up that dog food, there is still a force pointing upwards. This is Newton's third law in a very specific circumstance. And in more general wording, Newton's third law says that when one body exerts a force on a second body, the second body exerts an equal and opposite force back on the first. In the picture here on the right, the dog food bag has kind of caused the table to sag a little bit. The artist's representation of the fact that somewhat like a spring mattress, the, um, the dog food is pushing down on the table and the table is trying to push its way back up. The force upward is only there because the dog food is pushing down. Now, some other cases where Newton's third law might make more sense. If we think about a swimmer pushing off from a wall, either in a flip turn or just to get started, the swimmer pushes on the wall, which doesn't do anything for the swimmer, but the fact that the wall pushes back allows that swimmer to accelerate because a force is being applied to her, even though it was really her feet that we think is, is the cause of that motion. Newton's third law is really saying that there's always these pairs of forces when objects interact with each other. We can think of um, this as an equation, the force of object one on object two is equal and the negative sign means opposite to the force of object two on one. If I lean up against the wall and I push on the wall, the wall pushes back on me. If a basketball hits a ping pong ball, like is shown in the um, drawing here, there are forces at work that are equal and opposite, even if the force, even if the masses are very different from each other. And a car crashing into a truck, no matter the different masses involved, the forces between the two objects are equal and opposite. We will be seeing this idea, this concept, a lot more in chapter eight, rather than being, it, uh, being used to apply to example problems here in chapter four. It's really a concept that we introduce here, and we apply it later on when we're talking about collisions in chapter eight. Right now, we tend to look at one object at a time being pushed and pulled around, and so there aren't really two objects interacting with each other in this chapter. It's why we tend not to see it um, until later on. Okay, so we also want to introduce the common forces that you're going to see in all of the example problems that we do, all of the situations that we're going to introduce. There are a couple that are going to show up all the time. Weight is one of those, probably the single most important one because it will show up in every example that we do. Some textbooks use W for this, and a lot of the pictures that we have on our slides use that um, labeling. We will tend to use F subscript G, capital F to indicate that it's a force, and subscript G to indicate that it's from gravity. Now, it isn't a kind of big picture equation, but we are going to want to write this down and be using it all the time. On Earth, which is all of our chapter four and five problems, on Earth, the force of gravity can be found by multiplying the mass times the acceleration of gravity from chapter three, 9.8 meters per second squared. We will be seeing that applied constantly, so we want to make sure we recognize that it's being introduced right here, the
The force of gravity is m times g, and we're going to be using it in all of the examples we see in this chapter and beyond. A couple of other common forces that we're going to see. Normal forces. Normal forces, a lot of students struggle with because the use of the word normal here is the mathematical definition that means perpendicular, so a 90 degree angle. It is not being used in the more everyday definition of average or regular. A normal force only happens when we have forces, when we have a surface that we're pushing up against and that surface is pushing back perpendicular to the surface. If I have an object sitting on a table, the normal force is pointing up away from the table. If I have an object sliding up a wall, the wall is pushing perpendicular to the wall, which would be a sideways force in that case. Some textbooks use capital N for this normal force idea, N is already being used for the unit of Newtons. We don't want to get those confused. So we will use F uh, for force, subscript capital N for normal force so that we don't get it confused with net. Um, we're going to use capital N in that subscript. And then tensions. Anything that has a rope or pulley or wire involved, there is a specific use of the word tension that helps us recognize how this force can be very specific to two ends of the same rope having the same force being applied to them. If two people are playing a tug of war and the rope does not have much mass, all of our chapter, um, all of our physics 125 problems, that will be true. Then the tension on one side pushing one way and the tension on the other side pulling, sorry, in both cases pulling, Pulling the other way, they will be the same number value tension. So a tension in a rope will always pull, pull an object that it's attached to. Ropes don't push, they pull. And really we can think of a rope as simply transferring a number value force from one place to another, sometimes around a pulley to change the direction, but the number value force is still the same on either end of the rope. We will see these show up in lots of different examples, and so if my sentences aren't quite making sense without a context to apply them to, we will hopefully see that better when we do have objects tied together in upcoming problems and other uses of tension as a force. Now, we are going to neglect the mass of the rope all throughout Physics 125. In more complex levels of physics, it will actually have an effect because we have to accelerate the rope also, but that's outside the scope of our particular course. This is where we're going to have our first example. So right after this lecture video ends in the playlist, we will have an example problem that we can look at so we can see how tension is being used in a problem. This one also has some specific comments on units that we want to be aware of as we move through this chapter. Chapter one was all about unit conversion, but every single chapter we care about knowing what units things should be in our standard units and making sure we, we recognize when they aren't. So we will see this example fully worked uh, in its own separate example video. But the um, last couple of notes for this final introductory video. One of the important notes is the idea of positive and negative here in chapter four is actually going to be different than what we've trained ourselves to, to do throughout the kinematics problems. In section 2.7 and all of chapter 3, we chose the downward acceleration of gravity to be negative based on our kind of standard numbering system. And once we decided that the acceleration down was negative, everything in those chapters that pointed down was negative. If we threw something downwards, the velocity had to be negative for the problem to be set up properly we need to actually change our mindset for this chapter. When we draw arrows, that is indicating the direction. 
If we have something labeled next to an arrow, we never want to have a sign attached to it, plus or minus, because the, area, er, <laughs> the arrow is already doing the heavy lifting for us. Drawing arrows is going to be absolutely key in this chapter. And in that case, the key things we want to be aware of is things pointing in opposite directions will get opposite signs from each other. Things pointing in the same direction will get the same sign as each other. Since we will be looking for the total amount of force or the total amount of acceleration, when we are finding the net force or the total force, we will take the forces in the direction of acceleration minus the forces opposite the direction of acceleration. We need to do this. It is absolutely imperative when we have two objects tied together. We'll see those problems show up later on in the chapter. And it is a very good idea to train ourselves right at the beginning of the chapter to have this new specific perspective that we're just calling the direction of motion to be positive so that we can get the amount of acceleration um, that we're looking at. So to highlight this for us, we've got three different examples of a person riding in an elevator and how each time it matters which way we are accelerating. So let's say that we have um, this person standing in an elevator. The force diagram is on the right side of our page here. The scale that they are standing on is a surface, and so that scale is reading the normal force. It is reading the force that that surface is pushing on the person with. So every single time that scale is reading not the person's weight, but just the force it's applying to that person. Gravity doesn't care that you're in, ele in an elevator. Every single time for these three different scenarios, the force of gravity is just mass times g, in this case, 70 times 9.8, and we'll get 686 newtons. Okay, so let's think about three different examples. If the elevator is accelerating upward at 3 meters per second squared, what force does the scale push on the person with? The net force is mass times acceleration. 70 times 3 is 210 newtons. And in order to figure out what that net force looks like in terms of the forces that we have, it's the force in the direction of motion, the normal force, minus the force opposite the direction of acceleration, gravity. If you go through and plug in all of the numbers here, that scale is going to read a much larger number than the actual weight. It will read... 896 newtons, the 210 plus the 686. If the acceleration is zero, either the elevator is not moving or it's moving upward at a constant speed, constant velocity, the net force will be zero and then the two forces will be equal and opposite to each other. The amount of gravity will also equal the amount of the normal force and the scale will read 686 newtons. However, if the acceleration is pointing downwards, then the net force is 70 times 3, so 210 newtons. And in order to calculate the net force, we would have the forces in the direction of acceleration, gravity, minus the forces opposite the direction of acceleration the normal force. When we go through, if you choose to try this on your own to verify and we plug in numbers, we will get that the scale actually reads 676 newtons, uh, sorry, 476 newtons, much less than the person's actual weight. You can think about this if for example, you have ever been in a um, Tower of Terror type ride at an amusement park. When you drop, you feel like you weigh a lot less. That is because the surfaces that you're interacting with are pushing on you with a lot less of a force than what you're used to. If you've ever been in an elevator in a skyscraper that has 
accelerated up very quickly. You actually feel like you're being pressed down into the floor a little bit. That's because the surfaces are actually applying a larger force than what you're used to. Our feeling of weight, our perception of our own physical weight is actually just how the world around, around us interacts with our bodies. The surfaces pushing on us a certain amount is how we register how much we feel like we weigh. So if the next time that you're in an elevator, pay attention to any small changes in what you feel when you are speeding up and slowing down as you leave your starting floor and arrive at your ending floor. It'll be um, quite obvious once you're paying attention to it and aware of it. So we'll leave off this particular lecture video with this comment that when some textbooks call a scale measurement the apparent weight, that's a little bit misleading because scales are simply applying a force to an object. Usually it is related to the weight because usually everything is stationary, there's no acceleration, and so the forces are able to balance each other. But if you have any kind of scale at home, um, like an analog scale, either one where you hang something like at the grocery store or one where when you step on it, it actually rotates to tell you what your scale is. You can make that thing read whatever you want to by jumping up and down on it, waving it around. If it isn't on a flat floor, it won't read the right number. Scales are just telling you what force they apply to the object that you're trying to weigh. So just be aware of that as we go through the chapter. There will be lots of situations where we are asking about a scale reading and it's not the same number value as gravity. Whew. All right, so I will see you in the next lecture video where we will introduce and describe a whole set of example problems that will help us understand how to apply these new concepts that we've been learning in the last several videos to problems in chapter four. I will see you in those next videos.